Hello and welcome to A Team Group's webinar on how to make the most of market data. My name is Sarah Underwood. I'm an editor here at A Team Group and I'll be moderating the webinar. Our expert speakers today are Martina Sutherland, Global Head of Market Data at Fidelity International, David Bentley, Head of Global Operations UK and Ireland at Six, and Hugh Davidson, Head of Data Management at Man Group. I'll be asking uh, our speakers to introduce themselves in just a moment, but first some info for you so you can make the most of the webinar. To the right of your video screen, you will see um, a Slido panel. Uh, we'll be running three poll questions today, so do please vote so that we can gauge uh, what the industry is thinking in the areas we're talking about. And you'll also see a panel for your questions, so please place your questions there whenever you'd like to. We'll gather them up and put them to our speakers a bit later on in the webinar and uh, try and answer as many as we can. So please do just put, keep putting them there. And as soon as uh, we have quite a few, we'll uh, get them answered for you. So that's it from me So for now. So thank you very much indeed. And let me uh, come to the speakers to introduce themselves. Martina, please uh, set off on this one. So I'm the Global Head of Market Fidelity. Uh, I have 30 people in my team and they are based uh, across Asia, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Dublin, uh, London and mainline China, Dalian. Uh, I work across investment management, technology and operations. Thank you very much indeed. And over to you, David. David seems to be frozen. So Hugh, let me come to you next. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, yes, uh, Hugh Davidson, Head of Data Management at Man Group. I'm responsible for monitoring the usage and cost attribution of core market data here at Man. Uh, and I also manage the, uh, the business intelligence development function. Uh, my take on today's topic is going to be more around um, you know, how to understand the usage and why we're using market data as a, rather than the market data itself. OK, fine. Gosh, we've got questions on that, too. Uh, David's obviously having a little bit of technical difficulty, so let's get started with an audience poll and I'll ask him to introduce himself when he's back. So uh, the poll is what are the challenges of sourcing, implementing and consuming market data at your organisation? As you can see, the list is pretty long, but please feel free to um, tick as many of the boxes as are appropriate to your organisation. And while you do that, let me come back to Martina to set the scene and talk about these challenges of uh, sourcing, implementing and consuming market data. So this answer really multifaceted and I'm gonna start with the challenges of market data first. So first of all, we're trying to be efficient across. This can be really tricky when we have long-term agreements, we have overlapping data, we have different ingesting mechanisms, uh, having to source more, source more data than required because of regulation. Incomplete data sets, as well as lack of standardization. I think ESG is an excellent example of this. Uh, lack of competitiveness and alternative, alternatives in the market. Uh, when we look at implementing and also consuming the data, something that we all struggle with, and I thought Hugh will agree with me here, is the complex usage rights here. So the rules of distribution and redistribution of data, uh, individual rights, location, application, display, non-display. This is just a few things that we have to adhere to. And the impact and consequence of this is that we become non-compliant so quickly. Mm. Now, the cost of change, many people don't know, but we just rent the data as an organization. If we want to change vendor, we have to purge the data. And that's all, almost sometimes not in line uh, with retention policies and regulations. Now, and some of the commercial agreements are not in line with cloud technology. Um, we also experimenting with data is really tricky. Um, also, the way we want to use the data conflicts with how we allow to use the data specifically for, for POCs. And as a consumer market data, we might only want one benchmark, but we have to buy the whole family. And that was my final point. OK, that's excellent. Thank you, Hugh. What would you add to that? That's a, there are a lot of challenges here, obviously some more difficult than others. Uh, what do you see? That's certainly are. I mean, I, I would echo a number of the points that Martina made. I mean, from, from my side, um, I think the, the, the over, overriding message is that data can be very expensive. Um, so you really need to have kind of a clear understanding about what you need and, and why you need it. Um, also, there's you know, various pros and cons of, of, the, of the offerings from different vendors. Um, don't necessarily, you know, go with the cheapest. Sometimes uh, the more expensive one has better coverage, so you really need to consider what, you know, what you're actually paying for. Um, and as Martina says, you need to be very careful about what you plan on doing with the data. So, 
uh, if you if you plan on storing it down in the database or sharing it or publishing it, you need to make sure that any kind of commercial agreement you have in place with a vendor permits that. You can't just kind of pay for the cheap offering and do whatever you want with it. You have to make sure that you're fully <laughs> compliant and you have to make sure that you're able to monitor your compliance and ensure that you stay compliant as well. Um, how you interact with the vendor is another good point. I mean, um, different vendors have different mechanisms, you know, from API through to the more kind of classic flat file downloads. So think about how you're going to do that. And if you're dealing with multiple vendors, of course, you're going to have multiple interactions, multiple mechanisms. So make sure that you can kind of support all of those and monitor and, um, you know, keep, keep, keep on top of them. Um, I say my, my, my kind of key focus is really around understanding the usage of the data, how it gets into the building, who's using it, and, 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 and are, is it being used correctly? So that's kind of my my kind of key takeaway on that one. Okay, lovely. Let's see the poll results, if we may. And Martina, having uh, jotted it down, as it were, for many of the challenges, what would you say to that in terms of what our audience is finding perhaps most difficult? Yeah, look, I really agree with that. And I think it goes back to regulation. Multiple sources of market data are needed. I think that's the thing. And it's it's just coming. There is so many. We're coming into new markets. Uh, yeah, and also the implementation. I think we are so restricted in how our commercial agreements, how we can use that data. So that also creating sort of a cost and the cost of changing. I think that's the thing. In terms of being able to do back testing, we need to have that old data. So if you, it goes back to my earlier point, cost of change. The fact that we're only renting the data, that causes a lot of problems for people within in our industry to understand that. And then when you tell that to the business, um, you have to pay so much to store the data. So yeah, I'm actually not surprised at all. By those. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. And David, uh, let me bring you back in here. Please introduce yourself and then perhaps you can head off into the next question, which uh, considers the importance of market data and its existing and emerging use cases. But please do introduce yourself first. Yeah, so I'm David Bentley. I am the head of global operations uh, for SIX, um, covering the UK and Ireland. Um, so that covers our customer support function, it covers customer administration, it covers data production support, and it covers um, data acquisition. So um, to answer the question around uh, market data, well, you know, market data has always been of primary importance, and, and pricing has been at the very core of that since the very beginning. So you start with your asset pricing first, and then everything follows on. So reference data, fundamentals, and derived, you know, that's all, I guess, ancient history now. Um, more recently, it's been uh, data sets such as ESG and sanctions, and um, we've just done publicly traded partnerships, for example, and rated related regulations. Um, I think the, the other story, though, as well as use cases, is, of course, the delivery channels. So uh, there's API and cloud delivery. So that's um, really um, increased uh, a lot over the last uh, five or so years. Um, but going back to emerging use cases, um, I think one that really stands out for me is uh, retail wealth, um, particularly the mobile app. So, I'm sure, you know, a, a number of us have got these apps on our phones um, with uh, details on, you know, your shares or your ISA account. So an ISA account for non-UK folk is a, um, a savings account that's tax-free. And it's it's got, you know, uh, all the fund information that um, you've invested into. And it tells you when it's... Um, jumped or dropped in value and I get pinged, you know, if, if it's, you know, gone up five or 10% um, or down for that matter as uh, has recently been the case. But, um, you know, there's similar functionality for shares and share dealing. Um, you know, some people have even got CFDs. I mean, I'm quite vanilla in my outlook, but I know, you know, people who've got all sorts on theirs. So emerging use case for me, definitely retail wealth. And I think that's gonna continue to grow. Um, with demand for more information, you know, such as uh, ESG, you know, on, onto those apps as well. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And Hugh, what would you say there? You mentioned earlier that, you know, your interest is, is greatly in the usage of the data. Uh, what's important at the moment and what do you see emerging? I mean, certainly within, within, within man, within my organisation, you know, data underpins everything, you know, to, to David's point, it kind of, it, it, it's, it's the thing that goes into virtually everything we do. So having good data is is vital. Um, 
you know, we're using it to inform investment decisions. We're using it to measure our relative performance against benchmarks and a whole myriad of other things as well. Um, what, what am I seeing in terms of emerging use cases? I think there's been an explosion over the last few years uh, around kind of some fairly niche data sets. You know, there's, there's data sets of just about everything now. So what, one, of, one of the challenges is really understanding what you need and what's more of a nice to have and what you really don't need at all. Um, and again, I think to David's point, you mentioned ESG. I mean, that's that's of increasing importance has been over the last few years, you know, and with, with ESG so central to what we do, you know, having the ability to check, um, you know, to screen our investments, to make sure that they are kind of ESG compliant is, is vital. So all, all those kind of new-ish, new emerging data sets are really crucial to what we do, along with the more traditional kind of you know, traditional market data sets from people like Bloomberg and the like. Okay, thank you both very much indeed. Uh, and let's run another audience poll. Uh, if your organization is investing in or planning to invest in market data, why is this? Again, you have a relatively long list to choose from. So while you uh, tick your options, uh, let me come back to Martina to talk about why now is the time to invest in getting your market data right. Well, market data, like you were saying, is just constantly increasing. So for us, the three main driver, drivers, it's cost, the volume and regulations. And in terms of cost, the vendor is squeezed on the margins and they're looking to find other revenue streams, how they can monetize their products. But also as a firm, it's the same for us. We fee compressing business. We can't increase our prices. So we have to see how can we be mostly competitive um, and also combat those prices. Um, the same as volume is another driver for processing, handling, storage, managing that data. Volumes are not going down. As he was saying, we're just putting more and more data. So we need to come better at managing data. And sometimes it's really tricky to understand what is the value of the data that we're paying for? How do we show that? Mm -hmm. And I think my last point is regulation. And that is ever changing. And that is a huge challenge for us. In order for us to fulfill the requirements, uh, we might need to go to three different providers to buy those data sets to fulfill that requirement. I mean, SFDR is one of a good example of that, but also MIFID in the past, uh, so many. Yeah. Okay, thank you. David, when you are out there in the market and uh, people are talking about what they're going to buy, what they need, what are you seeing? Where are you seeing the investment going? And is now a good time to be doing this? Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of whether the time is right then i think if you want to grow your business and you want to you, you're going to have to grow your data sets um if you need to cut costs and um you know i think there's that cycle's now coming back in uh, to fashion uh, then operational efficiency matters so um you know data to always costs more than people believe that or not um and and the point with both of these aspects is that good quality data and coverage underpin that. So what we know from our own um, studies that we've done is uh, that data accuracy is by far and the most important aspect. It, it trumps everything else. Um, coverage and normalization are obviously important as well, but they're, they're lower down um, and then costs. So for me, it has to be, um, now uh in truth it was you know yesterday uh but now is the next best option you know if, if you don't invest now what happens is your businesses risk not being able to offer services um you know such as the ones i mentioned on on retail wealth and and competitors will come in and deliver that so using that example you know if i'm out there looking for a, a retail wealth app then i'm going to choose the one that's got the best data on it uh so it's got my you know esg categorized that, that I want to look at. And it's got, you know, historical pricing, it's got fundamental data. So if if you can offer that, then you've got that competitive advantage. Um, okay. What, one other point, if I may quickly. So sure. um, compliance, I think you just touched on it as well, is so important at the moment. It's, it's really tightening in the industry just now. Um, we're seeing increasing trend of our primary data sources, you know, such as exchanges, um getting a bit stricter on this you know they're requiring end user licenses for non-premium data such as you know end of day pricing if if you don't get this license properly um then you're going to have audits and fines and that's going to be more costly than sorting out that problem in the first place so um that's another area where we're seeing a bit of demand in addition to uh the additional or you know the the data sets such as um esg okay 
fine. Let's see what our audience has to say here. And perhaps, David, you'd like to comment on these poll results. Uh, so well, there you go. Of, as you <laughs> say, to improve data quality, accuracy and timeliness. Yeah, okay. and you see, I didn't even see that. I just um, <laughs> know that, that, we, that thing we've been well, told in the previous studies. <laughs> yeah, so there you are. You know, yeah. there it is. Um, yeah. And people tell us that's important. We know it's important. And, and we know why as well. You know, if, if, if you don't have that accuracy and you don't have that quality, then um, you're, you've got to put additional headcount into solving those problems. And, and that costs money and it costs time. So, um, yeah. Uh, that's good. I think what else is down there? Um, good to see that new services, you know, is, that suggests there's a bit of a growth mindset on at the moment. That's great. Good to hear. And um, it looks as well. Number three on the list is diversity. So getting some market data from new sources. Yeah, okay. um, I think that matches what we see too. But as you say, at the heart of it, quality, accuracy and timeliness on which everything else is built. Absolutely. Yeah. We talk about that in most webinars, if I've got anything to do with data, but yes, a very, very fundamental point. Thank you for that. So let's move on with a little bit of blue sky thinking. And can Martina, please, would you tell us in an environment with no restraints on budget, resources, and so on, how do you see the ideal market sales data scenario for both users and vendors? And then well, in the ideal to... world, do you world to... we would carry on that a... carry on that one and then we'll come back to the reality okay, okay. well actually I, I i i do have the, the i have the solution to, to oh, do you? Well, but, but, <laughs> I, but i can but i can wait to say it so basically i think the collaboration between you know an ideal world we all collaborate to get, together when there's uh, vendors and consumers where our input would help with the products so they could benefit us, we would help with the roadmap for the vendors. And from a client point of view, we want a concept like Snowflake Marketplace, uh, where we can make market data available for everyone, uh, one place for everyone to use, where we can also curate the data. Uh, we also want data democratization, where everyone can have access to data, what they need, and would it be interesting if everyone could get the data what they needed and we as a market data function didn't have to be the cost police. And also, mm -hmm. also where people can have a great idea and the cost is not prohibitive to even try it out. Um, and I'll wait for my solution. Okay, let me hear then from uh, Hugh, if I may, on the uh, how you'd like it to look given the choice with no restraints. I'll give, I'll give a, a slightly flippant answer, but you know, in, in an ideal world where there is no budget constraints, then you, you'd get everything about everything and make it available to everyone. Um, but of course, that <laughs> that that isn't that is costly and uh, yeah, not really not really a possible. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know, to echo Martina's point, it's 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 to do with kind of getting the right data to the right people and not being constrained by the, by the, by the cost of it, effectively. Okay, and David, from a vendor perspective, what would you say there? Yeah, um, so for me, I think I see streamlined processes uh, as core here. So this is things like data ordering tools, auto licensing, um, that allows us to, you know, focus on the delivery aspect. So, you know, it's easy to focus on the market data and itself, and that's obviously important, but it's never going to be perfect. So if you look at the ordering and handling process, um, I know that some of our larger institutions in our sector, you know, they've got dozens, if not hundreds of people working on this, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, it's a highly manual process and, and some, some outsource it, um, but it's still a manual process in the outsource operation. Um, and if you've got imperfect uh, metadata or data on the market data, so this is, you know, the data on the licenses, um, that just causes inefficiency all the way through the chain, you know, um, to invoice payments. Um, so I think there can be much better automation and standards here. Um, so I would like to see a scenario where market data users can request these data sets and go through a single approval channel to the provider um, with licensing, uh, recording, uh, reporting and billing all handled automatically straight through. Um, okay, there are some elements of this happening already, but it's it's really far from joined up and it's certainly not universal. Um, and it's nothing like what the music industry do. If you think about, you know, how you license and listen to music, we're, we're you know, decades away from where they are on that. But hey, um, 
I'm interested to know what Martina thinks because yeah, uh, she's got a solution as well. I, I, actually, I was going to use that as an example, but I didn't know if I was showing my age. You know, I think we should have a metered model. So instead of like paying, the, paying for the whole album, you can pay for the two songs that you're listening to. Uh, and so I think that also provides transparency and actually preview to the date that you actually need. I think actually cloud service providers does this really well. But I think that would be sort of a pay-as-you-go model would be what I would have the future as. Okay. And Hugh, how do you see the, the, the everyday challenges being faced by financial institutions? And again, so from, from, from my side, it all comes down to kind of, if, 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 if you accept that you can't have everything for everyone, which was, which was my earlier point, then it comes down to working out exactly what you need uh, and, in what, and in what way you need it as well. So focusing in on, on the data that you need is, is vital. Um, thinking in advance about what your use cases are, whether it needs to be real time, delayed, whether it's going to be a black box usage, whether you need to make it available to you know, users is important. You need to get that worked out because that's what your commercial agreement is going to say you can do with it. So that's what you have to do with it. Um, I think also ensuring you've got a way to manage costs in the future as well. So you might kind of budget X amount for the next year based on kind of assumptions about what you're going to do with the data. But of course, assumptions change. You know, the reality on the ground is that suddenly six months into the new year, you need to expand the amount of data you get or you need to you know, get something extra you weren't budgeting for. So you need a, mo a way of kind of man monitoring and managing those costs. So keep on top of what you're spending understand what you're spending and what's causing that you know what's driving the costs um, and make sure that you have a way of monitoring that as well so that if you're say you know, say you're paying um, per request or say you're paying for kind of um, number of unique securities in, in, in price bands you need to know as you're approaching the next price band or uh, as your usage goes up per, per unique request and you need to kind of alert on that, make people aware, make, make the decision makers who, who sign the checks aware that you're, you're, you're about to change. And the thing with the kind of the, the, the bandings as well, which is really important to remember, remember is that you face like a, a cliff edge increase in costs. So say you're paying in bands and you, and you tick over into the next band by just a single security, that could result in a, in a you know, massive multi tens of thousands or even multi hundreds of thousands dollar increase over what you're paying before. So you need to kind of be aware that that's coming be aware and, and prepare for it and make sure that people who kind of sign off the checks are, are, are in agreement as well. Um, the other point I, I would sort of finish on on that one is back to something we, Martina, I mentioned earlier, which is around enforcing kind of access rights. So you need to make sure that if you're bringing data into the building, which has restrictions on usage, you have a way of enforcing that usage. So you're not just kind of making it available for everyone to do what they want with. You need to make sure that if it's limited to New York traders, only New York traders can access it and the London back office staff can't. So make sure you think about that. It's not just getting the data in, it's how you kind of manage it ongoing. Okay, thank you. And over to you again, David, what do you see as uh, some of these solutions to some of these challenges that FIs face? Yeah, that's a really good point here around control. Um, and I think um, some of the uh, platform and technology partnerships um, with licensing arrangements built in, um, based on these predefined use cases, I think they offer the best opportunity perhaps for firms to leverage their market data. Um, so I know at six, we've got a large and increasing number of partnerships with platform providers. So these platform providers specialize in specific service areas and they provide um, both the internal processing software um, and the customer facing platform. Uh, so I think Martina mentioned, you know, the one that she's got, but, you know, they've, by linking in the data into the software, you then have a one stop shop in terms of provisioning, um, and that should cater for the use case and should keep it restricted. Um, some are more inclusive than others. So, you know, some uh, require, um, you know, the data sources to be separately licensed, and, and some are, you know, fully included, but Basically, they are packaged together. Um, I think, though, just as a caveat, um, you know, there is a risk of consolidation and, and probably need to watch this, that there's, you know, going to be a limited choice of technology providers. So in some cases, in some sectors, you know, we're seeing that there's one or two dominant firms um, where you almost have to use them if you want to, you know, service that business. Um, but certainly that suggests they've got a successful model, um, even if it does cause, you know, 
monopolistic issues. Um, but you know, the, the packaged use is is definitely a good solution to you know a couple of these problems that um, you and Martina have had. Okay, that's great. Let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into the technical side of things and let's have our audience uh, take a last audience poll if they would. And the question here is what are the key market data delivery options your organization uses or is considering using? Once again, you have quite a long list, so please uh, tick any of the options that are relevant to your organization. And while you do that, let me come back to David and say, how, how are trends in data distribution and managed services? Um, how can these help firms make the most of market data? You talked a little bit about the packaged situation there. How, how, how are these differences in trends, APIs and so on? How, how is this helping people? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the poll result because we've got, um, we've got uh, our own research, which suggests that there's a lot of growth in interest areas such as um, API um, and um, the cloud. So, um, you know, we've, we've got those platform providers that I talked about, um, uh, tying in the data from us and from other data vendors. Uh, and, and to do that, we're seeing an increasing amount of interest in API connectivity. So, you know, for example, we can offer this now on multiple interchange formats that we weren't able to do before. So we've got JSON, GraphQL, WebSockets, so we've got all of that. Um, and then that, the advantage of this over some of the more legacy connection methodologies is that you've got on-demand access so it's not like um ftp where you've um you know you get a flat file and you've got to wait or you've got to pull the next one you, you've got on-demand access and that's to our whole content universe so that's that's a real game changer for our uh for those customers that want that um definite trend there um what else so we've got um yeah, what else? Oh, oh, on APIs. So one of the things that came out of one of our studies was that API is already well established and sell side already. So um 75% was the stat I saw earlier that use or intend to use it within the next couple of years. Um so that's really high. Now buy side is much lower, it's it's um less than 50%. But then if you switch over to cloud, it's the other way around. So the buy side are big on cloud and um they're using, you know, partnerships um, to, to get their data through the cloud, you know, from, from the likes of us. And then we're using intermediaries as well to, to help um, help them connect to their target cloud environment. And that allows uh, the likes of us to um, enable access to all manner of different cloud environments. So we've got that capability through, you know, um, other parties. Um, and we've just built up our, our own six data cloud. Um, so that's, uh, it's in beta just now, but it will be available in prod next quarter. So there's loads going on in that space in particular. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see the poll results because I know there's still a lot of legacy and, you know, use as well of um, sure. data ingestion. For sure. But first, before we reveal the, the results, Martina, let me come to you as a consumer what sort of uh, trends and data distribution sort of uh, variations are you keen on and what it, what would you say is important? So, so I would say this, the themes are very much the same as for David and a lot of our partnership are with the, with some of the cloud providers but also with some of the vendors uh, I can't mention any names uh, but yeah so in that same vein so I would say the concept of marketplaces and data sharing is, is something that we're seeing and also applying uh, the one-stop shop for market data. We have clear description of the data, the user and schemas, and um, data sharing where we can mix our own uh, or fidelity data with market data. And also finally, Snowflake is a really good example where you can scale uh, as needed. But also all the points that David also mentioned, I would um, I would agree with. Okay, so certain times, but lots of options to still consider and maybe move on to depending on how that goes. Excellent. Actually, there's another point I would like to make before mm -hmm. we do move on, which I think is quite interesting. It's also how actually buy side firms are evolving in terms of distributing the data. I think a lot of buy side firms are looking to create their own products and commercialize them. So what we're actually seeing is that how are we creating partnerships with other vendors so we can add value to their products, but also them add value to our products. 
So there's, I, I think we will see a lot of buy-side firms coming out there becoming vendors uh, themselves, but also buy-side firms helping disruptors in the market because some one of the problems that we're having is that monopolistic behavior. So I think that is also another trend uh, that we are seeing to make them break the market. Okay. Okay, splendid. Your time is up. Could we see the poll results and over to you, David? Oh, wow. So there you go. Um, API <laughs> right at the top, hey? Yeah, um, the forecast day. Yes, and that is the forecast. So that that is not surprising because of the um, ease of uh, using API solutions. Uh, they're very configurable. Uh, and as I said, they give you on-demand access um, to huge array of data sets. So they're very popular as well with technologists. Um, and um, we, we know that this is the way forward. So um, that doesn't surprise me. I think what's interesting as well, you've got cloud in, num in number two. Um, so as mentioned, that's that's also a growth area um, and, and real-time streaming uh, too. So that's obviously your market data feeds, um, which, you know, continues to be, you know, a very much a, a core theme. I think what's interesting here is some of the lower placed items. Um, so sure, there's, um, there's still uh, quite a lot of delivery through the flat files, so the FTPs and the SFTPs and the MFTs. So these these are still uh, very much the backbone, I would say, of a lot of data delivery, particularly reference data. Um, but even even for um, you know snapshot pricing, for example, there's there's still a lot of usage of this technology, um, and you know it will be continue to be supported. Obviously, we've gone through the migrations now of FTP to SFTP. So they've they've still got a future. Um, and then, um, you know, further down managed services. Okay, that's that's actually a little bit lower than I was expecting. But um, um, I, I guess, you know, that's something that does have growth potential. Um, and possibly it might depend on your interpretation of what those managed services are. So, you know, if you're using... Um, a software provider to get your data in, you might not see that as a managed service. You might well see that as something that you're managing yourself. Um, and of course, uh, you know, if you're outsourcing it, you might see it as a managed service. So that that would kind of make sense, I suppose. Um, and then lastly, the good old email and HTTP. So that, you know, that, that delivery mechanism um, has been around a while, but it still remains uh, popular, even with some of the really large institutions, uh, just simply because um, some of the large institutions have been around the longest. Uh, they've got um, some old uh, technology and that that technology requires, uh, you know, traditional methods uh, to get the data in. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll be continuing to support all for a, a long period, but certainly the trend is API. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, everybody for voting. And if I may come back to you, David, um, let's talk a little bit about what technologies and solutions are helpful here. We've talked about API, are there particular things, you know, machine learning coming to the fore here, or other kinds of AI or natural language processing, other technologies that can really help to uh, help to sort out the data. I mean, you're not duping data, deduping data and all that sort of thing. Are there technologies that can help? Yes. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned uh, language learning and, and bots, for example, which um, have a role to play. There is, um, let's take language learning, for example. So service bots, um, that could be definitely something that takes off. Uh, we use them, for example, uh, to a limited fashion within, um, you know, customer support to help root queries. Um, the responses, though, are still uh monitored and reviewed by a human but i think in the you know in the coming years that will change um and i don't want to scare anyone we've all had experiences with you know chatbots um some good some not so good but um you know they're here to stay and you know i was trying to book a uh a, an optician appointment the other day and I, I was chatting with a chatbot and everything went smoothly i thought oh well you know that's interesting isn't it you know that wouldn't have been the case 10 years ago i would have gone uh, mad and phoned them but um, we will see, I think, the use of that technology for market data users to chat with their data provider and say, hey, where is this data? Um, 
rather than say raising queries or even using a, a search box. Uh, do you know I saw a I saw a query uh, yesterday, well, it was yesterday or day before, but it, it came in overnight and it was someone looking for an obscure S&P index on our system and they couldn't find it. Um, and um, uh, fortunately, you know, our, our overnight team sorted it. So it was a follow the sun thing. So it was OK. You know, they, they got a response within uh, a couple of hours. But really, you know, we would expect now that um, the use of that sort of technology for people to chat in, and you get um, a very sophisticated bot that can actually go away and determine that information almost real time. Um, so I've harped on a little bit about that, but in terms of data itself, um, we've talked about the deliveries through API, so I don't need to um, go over that ground, but I think in terms of qualitative um, analysis, uh, there are so many tools out there that we're seeing within um, you know, data production support that enables you to look for anomalies. Um, and certainly we're doing a lot more monitoring of pricing data uh, that we weren't doing before. So for example, in the past, you might just um, deliver data honestly as it was from the source. Well, now we're um, doing some validation checks to make sure that, you know, that data is, um, in, in good shape and in good form. And that's sometimes at the instrument level. So there's a danger of putting latency onto that. And um, we don't want to do that, but with the technology in place now, you can do um, you know, very quick real-time checks on, on that data. And that's, that is something that has changed and is, is continuing to change. Okay, fine. So lots of moving parts here. So let's try and pull some of these together and I'm going to come to Hugh first on this question. So Hugh, talk us through a case study of a firm or organization, a firm that's changing its approach to market uh, data and it doesn't necessarily have to be your firm. Sure. Um, I mean, I think I think th it, this kind of applies to a lot of firms, what, what I'm about to say. So I think historically, um, firms often focused on kind of the complexities of, of onboarding data um, and, and probably did that in a way that at the time they did it, it, it was fit for purpose. So, you know, they they onboarded the data that was required. They made sure it was permissioned to the right people in the organization. They made sure it was stored in the right manner. All, all good. And then over time, um, you know, things change. People kind of don't keep tabs of, 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 of who's using it or where it's going or, or how much is being brought into the building. And over time, you know, firms that do that run the risk of kind of creeping away from where they should be in terms of compliant usage of the data. And I think certainly everywhere I've, you know, I, I've worked, you know, there, there's an understanding that um, you need to keep on top of that. And you need to, you need to be co cognizant of the fact that the data providers are getting more and more kind of hot in terms of monitoring what you're doing with the data, who's using it. So um, I think you know, any firm that kind of legacy brought data on and didn't really think too much about how it's going to be used have, have had to change and they've had to put in place the kind of checks and balances to ensure that not only was it fit for purpose at the time they, they onboarded it, but it continues to be. And I know I keep on banging on about it, but you know, it's the idea of, 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 of continuous monitoring of usage and is it still fit for purpose? Are you still doing with the data what you're permitted to do with the data? Um, it's keeping on top of who, you know, who's using it, why they're using it, how much does it cost, all that sort of stuff. What I can say as a kind of positive point of encouragement is that most data vendors, certainly the ones that I've dealt with, um, make doing that relatively easy. They can provide very kind of detailed usage analytics around the data that you're requesting, what requested it or who requested it, all that kind of stuff. So it shouldn't be that hard to kind of leverage that kind of usage analytics, the metadata about the data to understand if you're using it, you know, in a permitted way, as in, you know, is your actual usage aligned to the permitted usage that the contractual say? I also okay. think, like, to Hugh's point, I think it's really important to stress this, and the reason we need to stress that point is because if you don't have the right controls in place, you can get millions of fines if you get audited. And I think we just need to call it out. And it's a huge scare for us as, as consumer firms. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, and the fact, like I mentioned in my early point that at the beginning, is with this complex usage, right? We might have the right environment two years ago, but with policies changes for every six months, we might be uncompliant by the end of the two year, two year period, even though we signed that contract 
with all the right controls. So that continuous watching is super important. And it and also getting understanding, you know, making the business understand that can be quite tricky until you get that audit and you get that big fine. And then <laughs> it becomes like a wake up call. So yeah, I think that I just yeah. want to like stress that point. Yeah, that's no, good. Point. And I think I think you know uh, you need you need to factor in not just the cost of the data but the cost of putting in place those kind of yeah. checks and balances because um, it may seem like an unnecessary cost to build those kind of checks and balances in, but that will pale into insignificance compared to the cost that you'll get if you get fined for using the data incorrect. Right. So, yeah, it's important. Okay, let's come back to that um, use case study. If you like, uh, David, what would you like to add there in terms of, you know, firm that's approached this kind of thing and the steps they've taken? Yeah, so, um... I mean, what what Hugh was talking about and Martina as well, absolutely right, um, and and good to bang on about them as well. But um, <laughs> I'll, I'll go on a different tack. I think so. A use case uh, that I I know has changed. You know, through my own experience being elsewhere, as um, you know, with at least a couple of uh, security pricing um, firms um, have gone through hubbing over the last sort of 10 years, and that's still evolving. Um, and, and this has been a definite trend. Um, and in, in both cases, and I know it's, it's wider than just two use cases, but uh, it started off with um, a, a relatively you know, primitive approach, you know, you'd have a couple of data feeds, um, if you're lucky, and um, that would be it, you might do some uh, validation, um, and, and and it would be prices out. Now, when I was starting off, or not quite starting off, when I was mid-career, I suppose, I, I can remember we would have, um, uh, a, a, if there was a data feed failure, for example, you would have to stay and, and fix the problem, and, and you wouldn't be able to go home or the team wouldn't be able to go home until the vendor had solved its problem and you had received uh, a reworked file and you've been able to deliver your job. Well, that's that's really moved on. So these um, data hub operations now bring in multiple feeds, not just two, sometimes up to six, and they plug them into this um, software. And if, if one of them goes down, it's fine. They can switch to another one. And, I know it's not quite as simple as that because you know that there are all kinds of differences in in terms of um coverage and um you know source expectation but it means that instead of say having you know a, a six or a 12 hour delay you're maybe you know going to have a, a you know a 10 minute or a hours delay at max so that's really changed um They've also continued this, and this is what's happening right now, is by um, onboarding multiple business areas. So instead of just one single business area that might be interested in, I don't know, fund valuation, for example, they're, they're being able to bring in um, other departments that also have pricing requirements. Um, and the reason this has taken so long is because they've got such different requirements in terms of, you know, price types and price sources and validation rules. But but what's happened is the the software is there now that that flexibility um, is there to allow, you know, all of that um, uh you know variation in requirements to be to be managed. So yeah, that that for me is is the use case um the, of market data that's you know changed uh, so much over the last you know five ten years okay thank you for all on that one and uh, let's take a quick break and take on some audience questions here and i'm going to put this one to hugh i think to start with anyway and it says given the high cost of data do you have an effective framework to measure the business value with incremental costs in market data I do. <laughs> so, oh, well then, how does um, that work? <laughs> so, 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 without giving away all the rest of it, um, so uh, we, yeah, we, I mentioned earlier that um, any any kind of good data provider will generally provide you with kind of usage analytics. So you not you not only get the data, but you get like a regular summary bit weekly or monthly of the data you've requested and what the drivers are behind it. We have built uh, a model where we are able to to kind of attribute all requested market data back to a system or person uh, that requested it. 
um, and ultimately back to a kind of fund within our organization that benefits from it. So we're able to kind of literally tie all, all data costs back to either like a house cost bucket or back to a fund or back to a kind of driving application. And it allows us to move away from the more traditional kind of model where we perhaps um, divided up data costs um, using fixed splits that were maybe set once a year with you know, one part of the organization paying 10%, another paying 15%. We're now doing monthly real usage driven splits. So we can say month on month, this is the data that we were requested last month. These are the splits between who benefited from it. Therefore, month by month, we're literally put, you know, putting up or down the percentage cost that each bit of the firm has to, has to shoulder. Um, it also allows us handily to kind of monitor something I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, as you're, as you're approaching the tipping point to a more expensive data cost, so be it like a, a cliff edge change for price bands or where, be it kind of per security requests, you can get visibility of that. Because if you look at it month by month, you can see upward or downwards trends and you can kind of go and speak to the people or system owners or, 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 fund, you know, or, or portfolio managers who are, who are kind of driving those costs and to kind of understand what, what the rationale was behind the data being requested and not police it, but just kind of understand it, give visibility to senior management that these you know, costs are going up or costs are going down. Um, yeah, so ha having that kind of model is really useful uh, uh, and, and kind of tying those kind of usage analytics back to your real real world usage allows you to do kind of cool stuff like that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And uh, Martina, something that you've mentioned and said how important it is, but the question is how best can we track and monitor market data across our organization with a view to cutting costs? So I think, you know, every, I hope I hope everyone has an inventory management systems. And I think it goes back to Hugh points where you can actually see, you know, every commercial agreement is tied to an invoice and, and, and that is that cost is split out evenly across, you know, operation, investment, technology, and and by be able to do that, you can then track exactly how much, how much is each department spending, and then you can go to your CIOs and discuss that spend. Um, you can also look at sort of how much files are you requesting? Are you are you actually using the data that you are requesting? Are you requesting too many? Uh, are you download, downloading the data in different environments? Do you have to pay for that three times? Can you, you know, change your tech, you know, do technical switch so you, only, you cache the data once? So I think in terms of understanding the data and challenge the data, you have to do that by an inventory system where you can drill down to the user, you can see exactly see what that person is using. And then what you should be doing is going and challenging that user. Do you really need that? We also do self certifications every six months that goes to the users. Uh, but yeah, you know, as David was saying in the beginning, we have huge cost drives now. You know, most firms have to save money. You know, in, in, there is headcounts, there's market data, different ways where we have to make sure that we are more efficient. And, and I think also it's, it's using the right data that we need and require. But it is a challenge because we can't just buy that data set that we require. We have to buy the whole family set of data. And that is, I think, really frustrating. And that's where, you know, in the future, I would like to have that pay-as-you-go model. And, and, and also the opaque pricing that we're facing as consumer firms. You know, we don't always know. I think Bloomberg is great in that. I'm going to call them up. Like they have a price list that might be expensive, but I know exactly what I'm paying for. Mm. A lot of firms don't have that. And, you know, I know my neighbors across the street are paying 10 times more or I'm paying 10 times more. You know, this was a great article in the Waters Technology that people can read about, you know, the increasing index costs. So, yeah. Okay. That was my answer. Okay. Okay, this one comes back to something we talked about earlier, and I'm going to pass it on to David. And it says, uh, what are the challenges and opportunities of managed services for market data versus direct consumption? Hmm. Yes. Okay. So the choice. Um, I think first off, if you if you do it yourself and you're managing it yourself, you've got control, um, as in full control. Um, there are lots of advantages of, of managed service um, in that you can. Um, use the expertise at that firm uh, so that you know they're specialists in what they're doing they're often doing it for uh, many other um, uh, operations like your own and and they know the data and the, the technology very well I think um, one of the challenges though is is getting and agreeing 
any bespoke work to be done uh, quickly and on time. Um, so a particular challenge with managed service is that if you're doing something that's not of a strategic interest to the managed service provider, then you will struggle to get some of those requirements done quickly. Uh, it's not to say they can't be done, and it's not to say you can't encourage them to be done by throwing money at it, but it's um, it's it's what I would say, you know, based on what I've seen and, and done, a, a problem area. Um, uh, but it always comes back to um, the element of control and, crucially, how good your contract is. So how how have you uh, covered those aspects with your managed service provider? You know, do you have that flexibility and, and do you have um, the right to insist on changes that you need? Okay, that's great. And we're coming back to the music industry example, and uh, you commented on that, Martin, so perhaps you could comment on this one. Uh, I don't think it has a specific answer, but it says the music industry example is a good one, but it took an uncompliant innovative, na na innovator, sorry, Napster, to break the model and change user habits. Who in our industry do you see is taking that risk to break our old and painful habits around licensing and compliance? Um... I mean, I'm just thinking about the vendors that do kind of have that pay-as-you-go and meet it model. I think that our, you know, AWS is a great example. Snowflake is a great example where they have sort of metered usage. You pay for what you use. Um, I think Bloomberg is great for that. Um, I think people are using toward, are moving towards that model, but I don't like, you know, exchanges are still, there's still a struggle uh, with them. Uh, because it's quite opaque in terms of the terms and conditions. I can't see any sort of front runners. Mainly, I, I would say the cloud service providers are really the ones I would would give a, a golden star to. Okay, fine. Okay. And uh, one for you, Hugh, and it asks, um, it's about generative AI, which is something that everybody's talking about. Here we go. Everyone's talking about generative AI. What could that mean for market data? Oh. Wow. <laughs> I think this is all exciting. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> should I, I jump in first? Okay, so I think like this was like one of our points like, that we're going to get to later, but in terms of the next 10 years, I think this is huge for us. And I think specifically, if you look at the buy side firm, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but it might impact us. But look, think about like our research departments. Think what that will help with that, like, you know, writing research notes, equity notes and company statements. And I think we are already looking at that as a firm or already on our perspectives, our company statements. So I think there will be change here in terms of how we'll be using data. What's gonna be interesting is how is this gonna be tied into commercial agreements? That's what I would like to see because we, we still have archaic agreements that doesn't adopt cloud technology. I mean, you will know this. So how will it cope with, with generative AI? So I think this is, this is really one to watch. Okay. You, your comments, are you watching it or are you running away? <laughs> watching it cautiously, I think. No, I, mean, I think everything Martina said is true, but it, but she made a fantastic point at the end there. You know, how, how, how are the market vendors, the market data vendors going to adapt to a cost model that you know, accommodates that kind of thing? It's, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Okay. Thank you for that, both of you. Thank you all. Thank you to our audience for the questions and to our speakers for their answers. I'm afraid we have more questions than we can answer in the time we have. Some have their names attached and I will share them with Six, our sponsor. And if you want to attach your name, please feel free to do so. And I'm sure Six will try and get back to you and uh, talk a little bit about your question. So thank you all for those. So coming uh, to our last two questions, we'll have to keep it fairly swift. And Martina, we talked about what you'd like it to look like. What do you expect the market data landscape to look like in 10 years time and what challenges will it bring? Look, I think we're going to have continued increased volume and regulation. I think the other point is technology and digitalization. We still, we still have challenges in how we price in crypto, uh, ESG, also new markets. How do we evaluate company, uh, countries such as Saudi, China, uh, India? Uh, I think we'll see big players still dominating. You know, we have the mergers with LSEG, um, and Affinitive, SMB Market, I think that's going to continue. Uh, we're going to have more uh, tech firms. And of course, my final point, gen generative AI. I think that's one to watch. Okay. And Hugh? Uh, well, echo those points. I mean, I, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see 
an increased proliferation of, of kind of the niche data sets I mentioned earlier. There's going to be more and more providers of more and more different varied data sets. Um, amongst, the, amongst the bigger providers, there'll probably be kind of consolidation there. We may see more data as a service. Um, I think we're going to see increased volumes of data uh, and inc increased regulations around how that data can be used as well. Okay. And uh, David, how do you see things looking quite far into the future? Yeah, I think we will have chatbots, but these will be supported by generative AI. And I think there'll be that capability to draw in lots of data. And then I think to answer the question around, you know, how how do we solve the problem on, you know, billing and usage and licensing? I think there'll be usage metering um, that will take place to identify that. And there will be an assumption that, you know, what you request will be what you want and what you will need to pay for. But um, yeah, we're, we're only at the beginning of trying to solve that problem. But yeah, that's where I think we'll be. That's great. Thank you, all three. So uh, meantime, and my final question to you all, please, would you provide some guidance for uh, people who are working to make the most of market data at the moment? And uh, perhaps you, you'd you like to kick off on this one. I'll kick off. And this is, this is again, it's probably points I've made earlier, so I apologize for that. But uh, I think, yeah, first and foremost, um, work out what you need avoid duplication, work out the best provider for the data that you need. And best isn't necessarily cheapest. Best is generally the one with the best coverage. Um, again, can't stress it enough. Make sure you don't just factor in the cost of the data, but factor in the cost of monitoring ongoing the use of that data. Build a model that allows you to understand usage, understand costs, even if you're not then using that to divide who pays for it, even if it's just still coming out of a central bucket, just understand what's being paid for so that you don't have any nasty surprises when your usage increases or you tip into another another bracket uh, bracket and make, finally make sure you are compliant do not okay. use data in a non-compliant way okay. okay and martine martina sorry what advice yes. would you provide yeah well, very, very, very similar to you. So I think become data driven in everything that you do and develop skills in analyzing and understanding the data. I think it's key for our functions. Uh, be able to understand the data requirements of the users uh, to be able to support and also challenge your users is important. And also research your products and trends as an obsession. Okay, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> David, some final words from you. Yeah, did, did anyone mention use cases or compliance? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, got that loud and clear. Uh, very much agree with those two. Um, I think on on the cost ones, so Hugh touched on this. Um, yeah, uh, lowest cost is a false economy. And I'd say also, you know, finally, don't always go for the biggest. Um, mix things up a bit. If, if everyone goes for the biggest uh, provider or for that matter, the provider with the best coverage is in the widest coverage, you'll end up with a monopoly. Um, and, you know, in, we often in our industry and in all industries, we talk about diversity in our people and the tangible benefit of that. Well, what about diversity in your market data supply? So, um, you know, if you always use a US or UK vendor, why not try something different? You know, why, why not try a Swiss one? You know, <laughs> just a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> okay fine some great messages there so thank you very much indeed david thank you to all our speakers uh, for providing uh, their expertise and experience thank you too obviously to six for sponsoring today's webinar finally before we close just a few forthcoming 18 group items that may be of interest to you we'll be hosting our next trading tech briefing in new york on the 8th of june 2023 and you can click on the link there or use the QR code to find out more about that. The lineup is great. It's a long morning only, so you can be back in the office in the afternoon. And you can also sign up for our next Trading Tech Insight webinar on the 6th of June, uh, Market Data in the Cloud, Fueling the Next gener Generation of Data Delivery Solutions. And or you can sign up for our 5th of October 2023 RegTech Summit London, an event which we'll be holding uh, then in London. So that said, that's it for today. So thank you again to Martina, David and Hugh. And thank you to all of you who have taken part in the webinar. Please complete our feedback form as we're always keen to hear how your views and improve our products. Meantime, thanks again and goodbye. <laughs>